This morning's reading is 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 12. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things to which angels long to look. Good morning. Let us join together in prayer, please. Good and gracious God, I thank you for this opportunity to speak this morning. May the words of my mouth be a blessing to those that hear it. May your word touch the lives of all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to sort of uh, set things up a little bit for uh, Holy Week, going into Easter, and talk about faith. What I want to get across is, what is faith? Especially, what is faith in Jesus Christ? Why do we as believers put our faith in Jesus Christ and not in other things? What is it that sells us on a faith in Christ? What is that guarantee or what is it that, that tips the scales and makes us want to have faith in Christ and not something else? If you'll notice, the number one thing on TV or in advertisements that they always try to get you with to try to sell a product is, they'll say, there's a lifetime guarantee. There's a lifetime warranty. But have you ever been able to read that small print at the bottom of the screen? It kind of says something a little different. It might say, lifetime warranty as long as this company stays in business. Lifetime warranty, as long as we don't file bankruptcy. And then the TV ads, not only is there that small print at the bottom of the screen, but there's also that guy that talks really, really fast. Has anybody ever been able to understand what he's saying? I can't do it. The other thing about faith is that even if you're not a Christian, you can still have faith. All of us have faith. Does an atheist have faith? Sure they do. They have faith in the fact that they don't believe there's a God. Do people have faith in family or friends or relatives or maybe even idols? 
The big question that I want to pose this morning is, where is your faith and where is your faith anchored? And why is it anchored where you have it anchored? When life throws a really big storm at you, will that anchor hold? Will you be able to survive whatever is thrown at you simply by relying on your faith? Well, this morning I want to look at how we can be assured that a faith in Christ is unwavering, solid, assured, and eternal. How it can give us that lifetime warranty. Let's take a look at our scripture this morning. Looking at 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, we hear, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is not imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. How is that for a lifetime warranty? Imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away. And that guarantee is reserved in heaven where it's safe. Let's look at that word imperishable. What is the opposite of the word imperishable? It's perishable. All things of the world, in some way, are perishable. We've heard it said that if the world were destroyed by fire, or famine, or whatever can be thrown at it, the only thing that will survive is what? Cockroaches and Twinkies. Twinkies. That's correct. Who said that? Yeah, I didn't even, did I pay you earlier? No. Cockroaches and Twinkies are the only thing that will survive. You can decide which one you would rather eat, cockroaches or Twinkies. I'm going to bet that maybe the Twinkies have a longer shelf life than the cockroaches, but who knows. But yes, you're correct. But really, the only thing that would survive would be the Word of God. Let's take a look real quick at Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. We've kind of heard this before. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. What are treasures that we have here on earth? Well, they're material objects, right? Collections, money, gold, and that list can go on and on and on. Men want a really, really nice garage, don't they? When they go out looking for a house. Women want a really, really, really nice closet to put all their stuff in. Let's take a look at some of the stuff that, you know, maybe goes a little overboard for collections and material things. Let's take a look at this first. What do you think, guys? This is actually Jay Leno's garage. And that's just a one little small corner of Jay Leno's garage. Do you think he's storing up things? Yes, he is. Let's take a look at the next, next picture. What do you think, gals? This is actually my wife's closet. I keep telling her, I think you're going a little overboard. The next picture is my car collection. Kind of a little bit of an imbalance there, isn't there? But what I want you to think about as you think about all of these things that can be stored up, 
God tells us that it can all be destroyed very, very quickly. What can easily happen to all of those things? It can all be gone in a second. Think about that. Cars, shoes, houses, material objects can all be gone in the blink of an eye. I know an auctioneer friend that I, uh, I knew several years ago, and he said, we can liquidate everything that you own in a matter of hours. Everything that you own, that you've saved up, that you've spent your life building up, can be liquidated in a matter of hours. We need to ask ourselves, not only where is our treasure, but where is our heart? Let's go back to 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. One of the words that Peter uses to describe faith in Christ is undefiled. So what does undefiled look like? Well, there's that phrase out there that talks about someone who receives absolute power. And we know that through absolute power can come absolute corruption. That statement speaks directly to sin nature. There are those out there who don't worship Christ, but they'll worship a musician, an actor, or an actress, world leaders, or certain politicians. How many people have you seen, especially lately, put a lot of energy and a lot of time into politics? But it's only a matter of time before whoever that person is that they idol, that their sin is revealed and used to discredit them. Then what that follower has to do is decide, will I concede to the sin that that person has? Will I continue to follow them no matter what? Or will I move on to the next best person or thing that comes down the road. Well, with Christ, there is no sin. And so Christ is undefiled. He's undefiled with God. God who has the ultimate power, where there is no corruption and no sin. Therefore, our faith can only be undefiled if it is rooted in Jesus Christ, not material things. To have faith in anything or anyone other than Christ leaves us open to disappointment, heartbreak, and sorrow, which will inevitably come our way, no matter what. Do you know someone who does not follow Christ or believe in God? Or say that they are not religious, yet they point the finger at God when their life does not go the way they want it to. They thank God for nothing, yet they blame God for everything. I'm going to say that again. They thank God for nothing, yet they blame God for everything. This is the result when we don't put our full faith in God. Understanding how God works will prepare us for the storms and equip us to accept the good along with the bad. We have a different understanding when things go south, when we have a faith in Christ. We understand and grow to trust and seek Him more in times of despair and fear. As long as we have Jesus Christ in our lives, no situation is hopeless. That's the lifetime guarantee that I want. We have to remember that Peter was writing these words to Christians who were being persecuted and killed because of their faith. I would say that that's a pretty big storm to overcome in life. Let's take a look again at 1 Peter 3-5. through the third way that Peter describes our faith, he says, and it will not fade away. 
reserved in heaven for you. Have you ever known someone who loves fads, things that just come down the line? They just have to have the latest and greatest gadget or item that is on the shelf. I'm guilty of that. I bought one of the little Alexa things for our house. Anybody have an Alexa? Come on. Time of confession. Time of confession. Yes, I see some hands out there. I thought it was really, really cool. I fell for it. I like it. I have one on the lower level of my house, in the living room, in the bedroom, and in the garage. Except my garage doesn't look like Jay Leno's garage. But yes, we do. We fall for, all of us has that thing that we want, that latest and greatest gadget. But eventually, what happens to that thing? What happens to that thing that people put so much effort and stuff into? A hundred years from now, is an Alexa going to be anything? Probably not. It all fades away. Let's look at the definition of what a fad is. A fad, trend or craze, is any form of collective behavior that develops within a culture, a generation or social group in which a group of people enthusiastically follow an impulse for a finite period. Fads are objects or behaviors that achieve short-lived popularity, but fade away. Pull that right off the internet. Fade away. Just like what's written in Peter's scripture, it fades away. Now, I'm going to show you some fads that have come out over the years, and I want you to raise your hand if you've ever had one of these. Ready? Let's look at the first one. Anybody know the song? Anybody want to sing the Slinky song? No? Okay, I won't embarrass you. Well, let's look at the next slide. Remember those? Yeah, I do. Guy, how come you raised your hand? You had a cabbage patch at all? <laughs> remember, the, remember the 80s when people were almost like putting each other in the hospital trying to get them off the shelves? Let's look at the third one. This is going to make you laugh. Anybody have a pet rock? If you don't have one, let me know, and I can draw a couple circles on a rock and sell it to you for, what, five bucks or something. All those things faded away. I got one more that I don't have a picture for, but who had a mood ring? Yeah, mood ring. So we're going to predict, we're going to be able to show the world what our mood is just by our ring. Don't talk to Nancy. Her mood ring is, is black today. So. <laughs> but in a more serious note, aside from those fads, those things that fade away, what are some other things that people follow when they don't follow Jesus Christ? There's cults. There's religions. There's Satan. The reality is that Jesus... Is the same yesterday, today, and he'll be the same forever. He won't fade away like everything else. That is why people sometimes can't accept him. The excuse that people use against following Christ these days and following the word of God is what? That's old timey thinking. That was back then. That's not now. They say that like it's a bad thing. But what it is, is it's the foundation and word that is needed to hold it all together and to survive in life. So putting all of these things together, it shows us what it's like, what that guarantee is to have a faith in Jesus Christ. We're reassured that Christ holds everything together when we go back to our study in Colossians. Let's look at that scripture, Colossians 1.17. This is very powerful if you really think about it. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. We've discussed that little scripture at length in our small group. In him... All things hold together. 
Sounds like a good guarantee to me. All things including you and me, our ability to survive in life, our ability to survive the storms that come about in this world are all held together by him. Also, another reassurance on where to place your faith. We see examples of faith and how it is imperishable, undefiled, and it will not fade away. When we think about things being imperishable, it makes us trust God. It makes us realize where everything comes from. If we go through life knowing that everything can be gone in the blink of an eye, it makes us appreciate the fact of what we have and where it came from. Val and I have this on our refrigerator, and I didn't make a slide for it, but I'll read what it says to you. It says, what if you woke up today with only what you thanked God for yesterday? Kind of makes you think, doesn't it? Moving on in our scripture reading, we can answer this question just like Keith says. He always says, so what? So what does this mean for me? Why should I put my faith in Christ and not my pet rock? Let's take a look at 1 Peter 1, verses 6 through 8 as we work through this scripture. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. We know that Christ is time tested as it is revealed in the word. We know that Christ has seen countless numbers of people through some very serious trials. That's why it's so important for us to witness to others. Because it is through the witness of others that we see how and why God works to protect us, to refine us, and to have us grow closer to Him. We see that refining process every day. Let's look at verse 7 and 8 again real quick. So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Does anyone know the process of how gold is purified? Gold is purified by heating it to a liquid state. Then what happens is the impurities rise to the top. Those impurities are then scraped off. That process is then repeated over and over and over until the gold becomes pure. Anybody in here ever felt so overwhelmed by a situation or a trial in their life that they felt like they were being turned to liquid? Literally, your emotions and your feelings and everything turned to liquid. Placed in a state of meltdown. I've been there. It is at that point that God is scraping off those impurities. Turning you to him and if necessary, repeating it over and over. But let's not focus on being gold. Let's focus on our faith in Christ, which is more precious and more eternal than gold, which can be destroyed. As we grow in faith, we discover a deeper knowledge of Jesus. And our lives will begin to change, and those around us will see those changes. When you look at yourself, do you see Christ? 
Just like a goldsmith can see his reflection in that gold when it's made pure. Verse 8 tells us that we love Christ even though we have not seen him. Let's take a look at Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. When non-believers say, how can you believe in something that you can't see? Well, I usually take them into a conversation about science, where they feel comfortable. And then once I get there, I ask them how they feel about gravity and oxygen. Can't see gravity and oxygen, but they believe that it's real. The entire gist of what Peter is telling us today is real faith is loving Christ, whom you have never seen, but still know in your heart exists. Let's look at the last few verses of the scripture this morning. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So how do any of us know with certainty what worked so well for Peter will work for us today? People like to say, just because it worked for you, this Jesus thing may not be what I need to get through life. I've thought about it. I've considered it. I've read the Bible. Eh, just don't need it. Well, Peter has pretty much predicted that these types of questions would come. Peter does this by telling us about the faith of others and laid out for us that guarantee that I spoke about earlier. Again, in the last two verses, we see that the prophets made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what time the Spirit of Christ was indicating. He revealed that they were not serving themselves, but us, those that are hearing the words today, us, the ones that are hearing this word today. And we are told that even the angels long to look into these things which are prophesied. Peter points out that true faith not only comes from the prophets, but perhaps more importantly, the fulfillment of those prophecies. There is a faith in the suffering and crucifixion of Jesus. The credibility of Christ is sure and unwavering. What's the number one tactic that a lawyer will try to do in a courtroom? To attack the credibility of a witness or a defendant. Once the credibility is gone, or the judge decides that you don't have any credibility, the case is over for you. Many have tried and continue to try to prove that the credibility of Christ is weak that the Bible has no credibility, and that Christianity is an old world point of view, when in fact it is the only solid and unwavering and imperishable thing in this world. The one true thing that we can hold on to, never lose or never forget, is that Jesus Christ suffered and died on the cross for our sins, and that because of him, we can have a faith that is secured in heaven. Let us pray.
Good and gracious God, we thank you for the word this morning. We thank you for the teaching that has come from Peter. We thank you for the sure and certain hope and guarantee that you give us, which is faith in Jesus Christ. We pray all of this in the name of your precious Son, the one who died on the cross for all of us. Amen. <clears throat> 